Hello. Um, I want to talk about something today that is, I think, very, very important to God. And, you know, it's not something I'm, I've been thinking about every day, necessarily, but um, I might as well think about it every day. Because, um, as, as I think about the Catholic saints as a Christian, more and more, and uh, the way they lived their lives, um, the way that I'm living my life, um, just just an inseparable gulf, just a, a, a total, um, totally different. And I am not a Catholic. I don't plan on being Catholic. I never will be a Catholic. Um, but I, I, I acknowledge that a lot of these Catholic saints, and uh, really only the mystic Catholic saints, um, what they call the mystics, and I, I, I'm coming more and more to hate that word, mystic, because um, people automatically think Buddhist, I mean, or, or some, you know, occult, you know, like, once once the word mystic comes up, people, it, it triggers something in people, and they immediately think witchcraft or occult, but no, not when you're talking about Catholic saints, okay, mystic means Catholic charismatic Christian, um, so, uh, I'm trying to find a verse here, and here it is. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16 Thus saith the Lord Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths Where is the good way and walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls Now a lot of times Protestant revivalists will quote this verse Leonard Ravenhill was a, a, a big fan of this verse. And uh, it only goes so far as to thinking about Puritans and Jonathan Edwards and John Wesley and Charles Finney and all the revivalists of the past. Um, prayer warriors, intercessors, uh, Reese Howells, J David Brainerd, Praying Hyde, and all those guys. <coughs> In other words, the Protestant saints. But, look, here, I still think that we need to, to, to seek, ask for uh, paths that are older still. Not just going back, you know, 400, 500 years for guidance. We have a 2,000 year history as Christians. You talk about asking for the old paths, and you only go back to the Puritans, which is 400 years. Is your vision so, so nearsighted? Are you, are you only able to consider Protestant saints? Now, I am definitely against pluralism. I don't believe that Christians need to be consulting pagans for guidance. I do not believe that Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus have anything valid to contribute to my Christian faith. Jesus is the only way, truth, and life. However, uh, within Christianity, there are heretics there are sects and then there there's the orthodox there are there are those who for for all intents and purposes stick to somewhat of an orthodox old path the traditional fundamental truths are still adhered to but it's not only about these truths being adhered to it's also about that spiritual life. 
it came out of the knowledge of those truths that was lived. And the more and more I learn about the Catholic saints as a Protestant, the more and more I come to respect them, the more and more I realize how much more spiritual they were than I am. And, dare I say, how much more spiritual they were than Protestant saints. And, uh, so, why am I even bothering with this? Why, why, why does it, why do I even care? Why should you care? You should care because you should want to live your life before God the best you can. You should not live at this level one Christianity that, that everyone is living at. Um, you should, you should want to, to, to ask for the old paths and walk therein. And, uh, so, so how, how is this possible? First off, I'm really only speaking to charismatic Christians right now, okay? And Pentecostals, but mainly charismatics. The reason why I'm not speaking so much to Pentecostals is because I don't expect Pentecostals to, to buy into this. They're too steeped in their traditions and Smith Wigglesworth. But charismatics have more uh, more promise in this area. Because uh, charismatics are new in the history of the church, as far as what I mean by the modern term charismatic. Uh, they have more of an uh, affinity with the Catholic charismatics and they're they're willing to buy uh, buy into things that that are supernatural, whatever it is, <laughs> for better or for worse. Uh, but in this case, I would say it's for better. In um, charismatics, they don't they don't really have any rigid tradition. Okay, so they're they're willing to modify their views if need be if they can get closer to God. Um, Pentecostals can do this too, but again, it's it's their church structures are probably going to uh, crash down upon them t and put them in their place and just say, no, you should just speak in tongues and do nothing more than that. Um, so, and, and, you know, Azusa Street, Azusa Street, Azusa Street, you know. That's just the terrible thing about Pentecostals is that is that they never really seem to go further than Azusa Street as far as their church history is concerned. Um, you know, and I've, I've read books where it just demonstrates total lack of knowledge of the Catholic saints and, and just of the, the, the spiritual gifts operating throughout the history of the church. It's terrible. Uh, there's one book I read by a charismatic or maybe even Pentecostal lady, and she said, uh, in the early days of the church, uh, the Holy Spirit was active, and God was pouring out the gifts on the church, and people were getting healed, and miracles were being done, and then, and then, uh, church history ran its course, and eventually... When we came to 1906 at Azusa Street, Pentecost happened again, and people started speaking in tongues and healing the sick. And there you go. There's church history for you in a nutshell. So you have this... <laughs> you have this 1,800-year this gap in her thinking as far as church history is concerned. The Holy Ghost is completely not doing anything for 1,800 years between the, the Book of Acts and Azusa Street. So, you know, the 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century, 5th century, 6th century, 
7th century, 8th century, 9th century, 10th century, 11th century, 12th century, 13th century, 14th century, 15th century, 16th century, 17th century, and 18th century, and the 19th century. The Holy Spirit wasn't doing anything those years. He was just kind of up in heaven doing his own thing. But then all of a sudden, BAM! Azusa Street comes along, and he's all of a sudden active again. Yay! You see, you see how lack of knowledge that is, how ignorant that is, and this kind of this arrogance can come when you start to think like that. Now it's it's an accident, no doubt. But then there, then then I've noticed at times I think it's on purpose. I mean, it, it literally is to keep. Pentecostals in their own kind of bigoted little sheep pen. So they can't look at others and say, you're my brother, you're my sister. A little Azusa Street cult. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, look, if you don't follow Jesus Christ and you follow some little, like, 100-year-old history and you only stay in that, that's more like a cult than it is following Jesus Christ, in my view. If you're so committed to your church heritage and your traditions that nullify the commandments of God, that's a cult. That's not following Jesus Christ. Okay? If you want to follow Jesus Christ, you, you need to stop being so committed to your church heritage and your church traditions. Now granted, granted, you need to know where you come from as a believer, okay? And and, and you need to know who to respect within the history of the church, because if you don't respect the right people in the history of the church, you're going to be a heretic. I mean, I certainly have no respect for Pelagius, who was a heretic. I have no respect for uh, the Gnostics and, and, and the Manichaeists and all these weird uh, cults that have come up throughout the history of the church. But I do respect various of the Catholic saints because they speak more to me, it seems, as a charismatic Christian than Smith Wigglesworth will ever speak to me. They seem to speak more to me about the path I should walk in than, you know, nostalgic speech about Azusa Street. Now again, not saying God didn't work in Smith Wigglesworth and that, and that God didn't work in Azusa Street. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying broaden your horizons a little bit, Pentecostals and Charismatics. That you have more history than that. Your history is not just 100 year old. You have a 2,000 year history. And you have tons of examples, tons of Smith Wigglesworths throughout the history of the church, the Catholic saints. So, I'm going to help you out in figuring out who these people are because in the past year or so I've been studying the Catholic Saints and um, you know I've had to really sift through a lot of people and really figure out who are, who are my favorites and who, who can speak the most to my situation. First off let me tell you that the Catholic Saints are broken up into two main categories. Those who are um, known as saints because they were ethical and those who were known as saints because they were mystical. Now, not saying that the mystical ones didn't have a sense of ethics. They certainly did, very much so. But um, very many of the Catholic saints were actually regarded mainly because they did good good deeds, like they started like a, um, a hospital for the homeless or something. But... Um, I have respect for the Catholic saints that were called mystics, or charismatic Catholic saints. The most well-known Catholic saint off the top of anybody's head is, is going to be St. Francis of Assisi. 
Um, I have a collection of books here behind me of all of my books on Catholic saints. And what, what they are is really just biographies of Catholic saints They're, or the lives of the saints, but not uh, in a collection so much individual biographies. This is the best um, work I know on um, uh, the life of St. Francis right here. This is a collection of three books here by Bonaventure. And right here you have The Life of St. Francis. Okay, it's a very excellent book. Francis had so many dreams and visions and out-of-body experiences. Um, it's amazing. He, uh, he cast out devils. He uh, levitated. It's it, God's voice, um, healed the sick, saw angels, visions, visions, visions. St. Francis of Assisi. Okay. Uh, okay. Now I'm going to start from the beginning and work my way up. We've got Athanasius. Okay. Uh, and this is not Athanasius, this is Antony. The saint I want to put, pay attention to here is Antony. He's got the life of Antony here. Antony, also known as Antony the Great. This is a manual on spiritual warfare. Okay, Manual on spiritual warfare. If you want to know about deliverance, exorcism, and spiritual warfare, you read the life of Antony. This man encountered demons so much in his prayer life as a prayer warrior and had so much insight into combat with Satan. A really general work is really great. This is from the, 12, the year 1260 written by a Dominican monk. This is called The Golden Legend Volume 1 Golden Legend Volume 2. Put them together, you've got this much on Catholic saints, and a good number of them are mystical ones, and full of stories of visions, and God's voice, and dreams, and healings, but unfortunately you will also find um, people praying to saints after they die, um, people praying to the Virgin Mary, very, very terrible, but really that's all you have to deal with. Again. Just like Protestants today don't have all of their theology that is perfect, okay? You have to you have to show some grace. I mean, we've got 1,800 years of Christianity here that's being completely ignored, okay? This has got to stop. Um. So I believe that the Holy Spirit was was working in the lives of these Catholic saints, and uh, that we have very much reason as charismatic Christians and Pentecostals to look to these Catholic saints for advice but not pray to them and not venerate them and not worship them uh, but to treat them kind of like Smith Wigglesworths um, add them up together and get a composite vision of what it means to live your life as a charismatic Christian uh, then we have this great book called Celtic Spirituality. And what this is, is it is a collection of um, writings from the uh, 4th century in uh, Ireland and Scotland. And you've got The Life of St. Patrick and uh, St. Bridget, The Voyage of Brendan, the Navigator, St. David, St. Biono, St. Melangel, okay, dreams, miracles, visions, prophetic, insights into healing as well. And you'll often find that a lot of the times when these saints were healed people, they had visions um, happening at the same time either beforehand or during. Visions and healing like went hand in hand with these people. Um, see here. Then we have The Life and Miracles 
of St. Benedict. This guy is different. He stands out among a lot of them, even more than St. Francis. Um, he, when I read this man's life, this is a tiny little booklet here. When I read The Life and Miracles of St. Benedict, I was blown away. This guy is like Elijah, okay? Okay, he was like a Christian Elijah. Very impressive. You know, if you don't want to read any of these other ones, then at least read this one, please. I'm just going to read the, the table of contents to you. You will be impressed, no doubt. <clears throat> well, I can't read the whole thing because it's too long. But the table of contents basically consists of just one miracle after another. Okay. At the saint's word, water streams down the ma mountainside. An iron blade is miraculously recovered from the water. Sound like an Old Testament miracle, Elisha? One of Benedict's disciples walks on the water. A raven carries off a poisoned loaf of bread. A young monk is crushed under a wall and then restored to life. A saint's prophet, the saint's prophecy about King Totila. Benedict foretells the destruction of his monastery. The saint is aware in the spirit that a flask of wine has been stolen. The man of God reads a young monk's proud thoughts. Two, two monks learn in a vision, actually a dream, how they are to build their monastery. A dragon blocks a dissatisfied monk's departure from the abbey. It's a demon vision. The cure of a leper by going to the healer. The miraculous discovery of some money saves an unfortunate debtor. An empty cask overflows with oil. A monk is freed from an evil spirit. A Christian with a demon. Hmm, that would settle a lot of charismatic controversy in that area. Scholastica's miracle, praying for the rain. Benedict sees the soul of his sister on its way to heaven. A woman is cured of insanity by stopping at the saint's cave. And I can just keep on going and going. Excellent! Uh, you get to just learn the manifestations of the Spirit in the example of, 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 of a charismatic Christian's life that was so filled with the Spirit. You know, a lot of times we're so limited. Pentecostals and charismatic are so limited by our understanding of spiritual gifts because of Smith Wigglesworth. Or because of 1 Corinthians 12 and says word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits and then we're left to figure out what that means right or the reading miracles in the book of Acts which by the way we hardly ever read any subjective spiritual experiences in the book of Acts except except um, Paul's vision and Peter's vision everything else is just objective miracles and a miracle happened and a miracle happened and a miracle happened but here you get to get to see the subjective perspective Okay, of the Holy Spirit's work in your experiences. Okay, this is very essential. If you want to understand the ways of the power of God. Okay. Um, this is really good. Life of St. Columba by Adamnan. Okay, the life of St. Columba. This flies in the face he was a Scottish prophet, okay, monk, in the 500s, okay, the 6th century. Um, his, this, his book is broken up into three parts, and, and the parts go as follows. This is, this is what the name of the parts of his book are broken up into, if I can find it here. Uh, let's see here. If I can find this. Okay, book one. Listen to this. Book one. Concerning prophetic revelations. Are you interested? Book one is called Con Concerning Prophetic Revelations. Okay. <coughs> Book two. <coughs> Bear with me a moment.
Book two is called Dealing with Miracles of Power, which are often also prophetically foreknown. Here, I'll let you read that. Now begins the second book, Dealing with Miracles of Power, which are often, often also prophetically foreknown. Prophet from the 500s. Miracles of power prophetically foreknown. In other words, he had vision of the miracle happening beforehand, and then he acts on it in faith, and boom, there comes the miracle. Hmm. There's, there's charismatic people argue about that topic till they're blue in the face, because they don't have this to, to end the argument. You see what I'm saying? They've got the Bible and their own experience, but they, they completely have ignored the Catholic saints, which are the ones with the spiritual gifts in the first place, that have, that have throughout history, that have, have taught the church what it means to have spiritual gifts. And so what charismatics do today is they don't have the Catholic saints in their theology, they don't have the Catholic saints in their understanding, even, the, even Jack Deere doesn't have the Catholic saints in his theology. Nor Wayne Grudem. Okay. Just always looking back to Azusa Street. Jack Deere goes as far back as the Covenanters, but still, that's only 500 years ago. Catholic saints. These people knew what it meant to have spiritual gifts. Miracles of power prophetically foreknown. Very important principle. And then you've got Book 3. Just kind of tag this one on the end here. Okay. Book 3, Concerning Visions of Angels. Okay. And he talks about lights, seeing lights, ascending, descending, lights illuminating the night, your whole house being full of the Shekinah glory of light. You know, you know, obviously, Catholic saints knew that, you know, like hundreds of years ago. We're just starting to rediscover it, the glory and such. Okay. Then... We've got uh, St. Dominic, the life of St. Dominic, and um, I'm going to be honest, for, for about 1,200 years, the Catholic saints did not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, insofar as I know. I mean, they didn't go out on mission trips into the cities and preaching the gospel. Um, if they did, their, their lives are pretty much silent about it. What they did is they mainly had monasteries, and they prayed, and they experienced God. Um, that's what they did. But, <coughs> when the 1200s came around, St. Dominic came around, and um, he was a saint that would actually go out and preach the gospel. And so he was a little bit different. He was what you would call a, um, a friar's preacher. And so they they um they experienced God and they had visions and everything, um, just like the old saints before. But they would actually um, study theology and soteriology, and then they would go out to the public square, town square, and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they would also go to um, state universities or universities and preach the gospel. So you start to see open air preaching appearing with Saint Dominic in the 1200s. And then comes uh, St. Francis, again, I've said, same time period, okay? And uh, really culminates in St. Vincent Ferrer. Now, I want to really pay attention to St. Vincent Ferrer, because if you are in a, an evangelically minded Protestant Christian, and charismatic, and you believe in, in uh, John Wimber's call to power evangelism, then St. Vincent Fair serves as a very good example of power evangelism. Okay, It is reported that, um, that he healed 50,000 people, 58,000 people over the course of his life. <coughs> and he preached what the gospel with the understanding he had at the time. In the, this is in the 1400s, one, 100 years before the Protestant Reformation. Okay, he preached all over the place. Vincent Ferrer. 
Okay, excellent book. Dreams and Visions, Apparitions of Jesus, God's Voice, Healings, Visions, Levitating When You're Praying. Um, good stuff. Prophesying the Future, Praying for the Rain to Stop. Good stuff. Vincent Fair. People can show you what it's like to actually have the anointing living in your life. It, it, and and the, what, what I want to emphasize again is that Smith Wigglesworth is just one person. Okay? He's one guy. I, I don't disrespect Smith Wigglesworth. Okay? But Smith Wigglesworth died in 1947. Just to give you some perspective. Everybody thinks Smith Wigglesworth, Smith Wigglesworth, Smith Wigglesworth. Because they don't have any history. They're just like, oh yeah, you know, Smith Wigglesworth. The only reason why that man's name is upon your lips so much is because you don't look to history. You look to your Bibles every time. You're still thinking like a cessationist Protestant. If you believe that God has spoken to, to Christians all through the history of the church, then it, it follows that you should be looking to the history of the church for insight about what it means to be a charismatic Christian. And that history is the Catholic saints, their lives, what they experienced of God. Okay, now don't stumble at the fact that they prayed to Mary. Yes, some of them did pray to Mary, and some of them did pray to saints, but that wasn't keeping the main thing the main thing. They were Christ-centered for the most part, and they prayed to Christ. They prayed to the Trinity. It's another thing a lot of people have... Um, charismatics have gotten off track off. They don't pray to the Trinity anymore. We only pray to the Holy Ghost or, or Jesus maybe. Anyway, this is a great one right here. The life of holy the life of the holy Hildegard, Hildegard of Bengen. This lady is probably the most prophetic seer in the history of the church. Visions, visions, visions all of the time. She cast out demons. There's some really good exor um, exorcism insight in this book. Um, just in regards to the, 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 the how visions interact with exorcism. Okay. Visions are extremely important to the Catholic saints. Visions, 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 and dreams. Very important. Okay, you've got three parts to her, her book. First book, Her Life. She talks about her life which is full of miracles. Second book, Visions. Okay, The second book is all visions that she had. Not all of the visions that she had, just selections. And then third book is Healing and Deliverance Miracles. Okay, Healing of a lady with hemorrhage, healing a uh, emotionally sick woman, healing a deathly sick soldier, a blind boy recovers his lost vision, healing epilepsy, about a possessed woman. I mean, just keeps on going and going. Healing of a Swabian with a tumor, Cure of a lady with a tumor on the neck just keeps on going. Hildegard of Bingen. The life of the Holy Hildegard. Excellent. Look into these things, please. It's not just Smith Wigglesworth only. Okay, we've got tons of tons of Holy Ghost filled Catholic saints that we can get insight from um, into what it means to live our life. Okay, and now this is the one I'm working on right now. Um, I'm actually writing a book on the history of the prophetic, and a lot, of it, a lot of it has to do with kind of just a review of each and every one of these Catholic saints' lives. And um, I'm, um, I'm currently working on Ignatius of Loyola. Here we go. Here's in the front cover, he's having a vision of Jesus. This is a vision. He's with his friends, and he has a vision of Jesus, and the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. This man visions, visions, visions. Okay. Okay, he had visions, he had spiritual warfare encounters. Oh, by the way, there are lots of visions of the devil in the history of the Catholic saints. Okay, um, they don't pull any punches on spiritual warfare areas or anything. In fact, a lot of the, the, the viewpoints that um, deliverance people in deliverance ministry have are actually backed up by a lot of these Catholic saints. Can a Christian have a demon? Absolutely. Yes, a Christian can have a demon, and a Christian should be delivered. <coughs> uh, how do you know somebody has a demon? You have a vision. Okay? 
visions are a central concept to the lives of the Catholic saints, as well as contemplative prayer. Not this Eastern meditation yoga stuff that came into the Catholic Church in the 1960s. I'm talking about old-fashioned, ancient Catholic monk contemplation and prayer. Okay, This is not Buddhist, Hindu, hippie stuff. New Age. This is old-time Catholic monk meditation practice. Okay. And then after St. Ignatius comes... Uh, the life of St. Teresa of Avila by herself. St. Teresa is still many, uh, many know who she is today, thankfully. She's kind of like, um, but I'm telling you though, she's like the, at the end of the train, so to speak. Um, if, if, the, if the lives of the Catholic saints could be looked at as an engine to a caboose and all these cars in between, St. Teresa comes at the end. She's like the caboose of this train of Catholic saints. So don't just look at St. Teresa and think, oh, there's an example. And she's like the last example. Okay? And then we come into the Protestant um, era. So she, she died in the year, um, I want to say 1577. I mean, she died during the Protestant Reformation. Okay, so she's like the last, one of the last. And then after her comes... St. John of the Cross, and they wrote, she wrote in depth about her vision experiences and her encounters with the angels and God and Jesus, and so very prophetic, very amazing. She wrote a lot about contemplative prayer and, and how that opens you up to God. Now, I don't know whether or not to, to um, recommend this one to you or not, but this is also, this is the last one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present. This is called God's Fools, The Lives of the Holy Fools for Christ, by Bishop Varlam Novakshinov. And this is a, this actually is an Eastern Orthodox collection written for children of Eastern Orthodox saints. And uh, you find some weird stuff in here. Supernatural stuff, no doubt, which is always nice. But you find some really extreme ascetic practices in here and people praying to Mary, so I don't even know if it's worth looking at it, but if you want to read something that's from a non-Catholic and just realize there are also prophetic Catholic saints in the Eastern Orthodox heritage as well, and um, but since we're Protestants we tend to look to the Catholics as more, because we came out of the Catholic Church, the Protestants did, um, so Protestants have pretty much no connection to the Eastern Orthodox. Nevertheless, the Russian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox, they also have a whole bunch of prophetic, mystic, Catholic uh, saints of their own. And so here's a good just kind of a spark plug to get you started on that. God's fools, the lives of the holy fools for Christ. There are so hundreds and hundreds of Smith Wigglesworths throughout history. And I, I, want, I want you to know that there are books on their lives, their experiences of the Holy Spirit. And we have much, much to learn from them. And uh, so, anyhow, a lot of our questions about the mysteries of God can be answered simply by reading these books. A lot of our, uh, you know, theological questions can just simply by be answered by reading about the Catholic saints. You need to get over this old Protestant mentality that. All I've got is my personal experience and the Bible, okay? You've got to read the Catholic Saints to help you gain fresh perspective on what it means to hold in tension the theological authority of the Bible and the, the, your subjective spiritual experience. The Catholic Saints should, should shine light on this, okay? Now granted, we all want perfect theology, but we're never going to gain it. I mean, granted, I think that Assemblies of God, Church of God, and Pentecostal Holiness has got pretty near perfect theology. That might sound pretty bigoted to some people, but <clears throat> I think that the classic Pentecostal denominations have got probably the most perfect theology, yeah, in, in all of the, all of the churches. Okay, that's just my humble opinion, okay? And, uh... 
So, you don't have to agree with everything you read. But here's the thing. When you, when you keep on reading the same thing over and over, in that person's life, in this person's life, in this person's life, you start to get confirmation. Wow, you know. Dreams and visions are, like, so important to God. Okay? And, and if you start getting off on, on tangents, and, and certain aspects of holiness as well, you'll read that as well. You, and then you look at and you judge it in light and you judge today's charismatic movement in light of this stuff. You see how far we have fallen from the standard. So I really want to just urge you read about these Catholic saints I've talked to you about. Be critical. Um, don't don't ex don't accept everything you read. Like don't pray to Mary and stuff. But um, I mean, don't. That's not everything. Okay. And and don't and don't abuse your body by fasting too much and this and that. I mean, you you learn these not these guys didn't have it all together. They weren't perfect, but they they experienced God very deeply. And I want you to know that. I want you to know that. Um, I don't want you to become a Catholic. I want you to stay a charismatic Christian, but. I'm just saying that your understanding, if you want to really be a charismatic Christian, you want to, you more, really want spiritual gifts in your life, then you need to follow it to its logical conclusion. And the logical conclusion is God spoke to the Catholic saints for centuries before Azusa Street. And, and, and uh, it would be foolish to just simply ignore them and just read your Bible and read about Smith Wigglesworth. Okay, this has been happening all throughout the history of the church. We would be foolish to reject all of the wisdom that God imparted, all the revelations that God imparted to these, these men and women of God. So I want to encourage you, I want to bless you, in the name of Jesus, to, to, go far, to go far with God. Go far. Go as far as you can with God. Okay, in Jesus' name, amen.